If you want to know the truth, if Hoffman could have survived at the end of the Saw movies, then stick around to the end of this video. Throughout Jigsaw's active years, he brought on a few disciples to help him carry out his plans, and eventually take over for him after his passing. One of these students would go on to overshadow John Kramer himself, and that was Lieutenant Detective Mark Hoffman. Welcome to Horror History, my name is Admiral Chancellor Professor CZ's World, and in today's lesson, we're going to be going over the entire known history of the most evil man to bear the Jigsaw name so far, Mark Hoffman. Hoffman may have been partially named after a well-known American criminal, Mark William Hoffman, who similarly spun into a murderous episode after his plans unravel. His name was also a tribute to the late Greg Hoffman, one of the trio of producers responsible for Saw 1 and 2, who is still honored in the credits of every movie. The Saw character Hoffman did not start off as a psychopath, though. He never even had a criminal record during his lifetime. So to understand his journey, let's go back to his earliest mention in the series. Hoffman was likely born in the mid-60s. In 1976, his sister Angelina was born. It's not known what happened to his parents, but in his adulthood, Angelina was his only family member. I know she was your only family. After graduating from Renfield University, Mark Hoffman became a cop in the early 80s. He's been a cop for 20 years. Is that long enough for you? One of his earliest known cases took place at an elementary school, where he and Officer Daniel Rigg investigated an abusive teacher. They're unable to get solid evidence against the guy, and a frustrated Rigg overreacts to a slap on the back and punches the teacher in the face. Go! Hoffman claims that the teacher attacked Rig first, which is a long stretch of the truth, and signs an affidavit vowing that he witnessed it. I see this as the first example of Hoffman's belief that it's okay to sidestep required procedures to bring someone to justice, or at least what he views as justice. In this case, he believes the teacher is guilty, and he bends the truth in order to see that he's locked up. He would later use a similar tactic to try to bring another criminal to justice, but this time, it would be personal. In 1997, Hoffman's sister Angelina was killed during a domestic dispute with her boyfriend, Seth Baxter. She was just 25 five years old. Mark felt helpless after losing his only family. His job was to serve and protect, but he was unable to protect the only person that mattered to him. He became an alcoholic and lost all joy in his life. This gets the attention of John Kramer, whose goal is to make sure that everyone cherishes their lives. You sit in bars until closing. You drink so you can sleep. You stagger to your car and then you start in all over again the next day. But John doesn't take action on Hoffman quite yet. After a long trial, Baxter is eventually convicted and sentenced to 25 years in prison starting in 1999. In the meantime, there is another police incident that tells us more about Hoffman's character. While responding to a distress call at a flop house full of junkies, he saves the life of another officer named Matt Gibson. After ordering the junkie to drop the weapon, Hoffman proceeds to shoot him several times. Like the incident at the school, Hoffman is taking the law into his own hands rather than letting due process play out. He also sees this as a favor to Gibson. You owe me. But Gibson, one of the few cops who is not corrupt, reports him for brutality. What brutality? However, he still saved an officer's life, so Hoffman ends up getting promoted. One year later, Gibson transferred to Internal Affairs, where he busted three of Hoffman's men, and Hoffman swore he'd have his revenge. Just remember that, because it could come back. I'm not saying it's gonna come back, but it might come back. But for now, let's fast forward a couple more years to May of 2004. Seth Baxter had served five years for the murder of Hoffman's sister, at which point he was released on a technicality. Seems to happen a lot in this city. At this point, the police department had recently formed a serial killer task force responsible for solving a series of murders all accredited to a criminal who was beginning to come known as the Jigsaw Killer. Hoffman was not an investigator on the first couple of cases, but is aware of Jigsaw's activity, which gives him an idea of how he could get revenge on Seth Baxter. That June, he creates a trap similar in style to the trap that Jigsaw had used to kill his victims, but with one key difference. Hoffman's trap, which involved a giant swinging pendulum, was inescapable. Hoffman took pleasure in watching his sister's killer get torn in half through a peephole in the wall, but little did he know, Jigsaw was still keeping an eye on him and knew about his copycat crime. Jigsaw waited in the elevator at Hoffman's apartment complex to sedate him and drag him to his workshop. When he awakes, he finds himself in a real jigsaw trap, where his arms are tied to a chair and wired to a shotgun so that too much movement would pull the trigger. John explains that he believes everyone deserves a second chance, and that in his games, if a player survives, they're instantly rehabilitated. John did not appreciate Hoffman ripping off his work, because Hoffman's game did not offer the victim a chance to survive. But true to his word, John is going to give Hoffman a chance. He lets him out of the chair and tells him that he can try to arrest or kill him, but if he does, the truth about Hoffman's guilt will automatically be released. So Hoffman is given no choice but to join Jigsaw Jigsaw in his work to test and rehabilitate others who no longer cherish their lives. By joining him, Hoffman had passed Jigsaw's first test and would begin to learn his moral code and methods of rehabilitation. During the construction of the next Jigsaw trap, John would impart one of the most important rules onto his pupil.
The first victim that Hoffman assisted Jigsaw in capturing was a man named Paul, whose will to live would be tested in a maze of barbed wires. During the setup of this trap, Jigsaw explains one of the most important rules of the operation. Roll it. The heart cannot be involved. Emotionally, there can be nothing there. It can never be personal. Which seems kind of hypocritical because almost everyone that John tested was connected to him personally, but maybe this is just a rule for Hoffman because he already went after his sister's ex-boyfriend with the pendulum trap and Jigsaw feared he would use the platform for personal reasons again. Using his inside knowledge as a metropolitan police detective, Hoffman warns John that there's a cop who's onto him, a man by the name of David Tapp. John plans to throw Tapp off by having Hoffman plant Dr. Lawrence Gordon's pen light at one of the crime scenes. He does this at the site of the next trap where a victim is burned alive trying to solve Jigsaw and Hoffman's puzzle. As far as we know, Hoffman was not involved in any of the other traps that took place in 2004 because Jigsaw wanted to recruit new followers like the previously mentioned Lawrence Gordon and a junkie named Amanda Young. Amanda's second test took place in October of 2005 when a group of criminals would be forced to take part in a game at the Nerve Gas House. This was the most complex and riskiest game Jigsaw had ever held, so he enlisted the help of Hoffman to set it up and test it. It is here that Hoffman learns to never assume any outcome. I anticipate the possibilities and I let the game play out. Why do you need a band in the game? I'm sure that the rules are followed. Hoffman seems to think that this method leaves too much to chance, once again highlighting his belief that he should be a judge rather than just an enforcer. It's becoming apparent that this is his biggest flaw, the reason that he'll never fully realize the Jigsaw moniker in the future. John is wary of this and begins to put a number of safeguards in place so that Hoffman isn't just given free reign in the event of his passing. But John does survive the events of the Nerve Gas House game in 2005 and goes to work on his next two games, which would take place simultaneously in April of 2006. In the meantime, Hoffman still to keep up with his actual job as a police detective. He investigates the classroom trap, the classroom trap, which was created by another Jigsaw apprentice, Amanda Young. He has to kind of play dumb at the crime scene because he obviously knew that this one wasn't created by Jigsaw himself, but he wasn't about to make himself look guilty by being the one to point it out. Though he could have used reverse psychology to make himself look less guilty by actively pointing it out. But maybe he was using reverse reverse psychology knowing that the other cops would expect a guilty person to try to use reverse psychology. But then again... Sorry, that's literally what my brain is like all the time. In order to keep up the appearance that he's actively looking for Jigsaw, he brings in Jill Tuck, the ex-wife of John Kramer, for interrogations. He tries to make her look guilty by asking her why she's in possession of a doll resembling Billy the Puppet, which is the avatar used in many of the videotapes that Jigsaw left for his victims. He also presses her about having a tricycle that Billy is often seen riding, which she claims is a relic from John's youth. Supposedly, there are hours and hours of interrogation footage. The next victim to be tested is one of Hoffman's fellow investigators, a woman named Allison Carey. Jigsaw wanted to test her because he believed that she was dead on the inside. Amanda was responsible for setting up this trap as well, and Hoffman lended her a hand in hoisting the unconscious body up into the trap. This would ultimately be a mistake on Hoffman's part, one that would lead the FBI to determine that there were other Jigsaw apprentices besides Amanda, because she would not have been strong enough to lift Detective Carey into the trap on her own. Hoffman has to play dumb again at the crime scene where Carey is discovered, causing the two FBI agents, Peter Strom and Lindsay Perez, to become somewhat suspicious of him. Over time, Strom would become Hoffman's biggest obstacle. Hoffman makes some last minute adjustments on the day that the two games would be played simultaneously on April 28, 2006. One involves a man named Jeff Denlin, who must face a series of trials to forgive the people involved in a drunk driving accident that killed his son. Hoffman was responsible for sedating and bringing in the drunk driver. John was critical when he saw the way that Hoffman treated the body of the man being tested. John also offers him some engineering pointers to better optimize the machine, which is known as the rack, that the drunk driver would be restrained in. This is an interesting interaction for two reasons. Hoffman's carelessness with the victim shows us his subconscious desire to do harm. His goal for taking part in Jigsaw's operations is more about punishing wrongdoers than rehabilitating them. And that's not something that John Kramer would approve of. But the second part of the interaction shows us that Hoffman isn't just there to assist Jigsaw with the creation of the traps, he's actively learning about mechanical engineering because he will be expected to create traps of his own in the future. This means that Hoffman is gaining the trust of Jigsaw and he may one day be allowed to take on the Jigsaw name in order to continue John's work. However, Amanda was receiving similar training and if Hoffman wanted full control to punish whoever he pleases, he would have to get her out of the picture. So the two develop a bit of a rivalry. Sure about that? No. 
At first, it seems Hoffman is just taunting Amanda, but it soon becomes clear that he has a plan to get rid of her, a plan he was even able to sneak underneath the nose of Jigsaw himself. Outside of Jeff Denlin, there are several others being tested on April 28th. One of these is Jeff's wife, a surgeon named Lynn Denlin. Her job is to keep a dying John Kramer alive as long as possible to make her appreciate life again. Amanda is also being tested, because Jigsaw found out that she was letting her emotions interfere with the natural results of each game by putting the people that she felt should be punished through inescapable traps, not too different from what Hoffman did with the pendulum. So Amanda's role is to keep Lynn Denlin alive so that Lynn can keep John alive. Amanda doesn't know she's being tested, but Hoffman does, and he comes up with the plan to use this knowledge to his advantage in an attempt to get rid of Amanda and Jigsaw in one fell swoop, leaving him as the last remaining man in the operation. With the deaths of Singh, Tapp, and Carey, and with the disappearance of Eric Matthews, Hoffman was one of the last remaining detectives on the serial killer task force. He was there to investigate both traps that Amanda rigged to be inescapable, so he knew better than anyone that her weakness was her fiery emotion, and figured out a way to use that against her. While John is on his deathbed, he asks Hoffman to place a note for Amanda to find, and he changes it out with the message of his own. But before she would open it, Hoffman had some other business to attend to. He first reports back to Jigsaw in Secrets. This would be his last face-to-face with him since John didn't have much longer to live. John's last request to Hoffman is to carry out another game on his behalf after his death. He hands him an envelope with the instructions, and Hoffman tucks it away for later. First, he had another set of tasks to take care of. Remember how there was supposed to be a simultaneous game being played on April 28th? Well, Hoffman had a lot to do to get that one started. He has to kidnap Rig and put him at the start of his trial, retrieve another cop, Eric Matthews, and put him on a block of ice, and presumably also subdue a lawyer named Art Blank and put him in this neck trap thingy, and leave him Jigsaw's instructions on what to do if he wants to survive. And then I guess he has to kidnap himself and go into the room where this is all taking place. I know that sounds a bit confusing, because it is, but let's break down how everything is connected. The main one being tested here is Rig, because Jigsaw has determined that he's become too obsessed with saving his comrades and isn't living his life or spending time with his wife anymore. There are probably worse people out there who could be tested, but that's who John chose, and as long as John's around, Hoffman has to obey his orders. In order for Rig to pass, he simply has to not try to save his co-workers, Matthews and Hoffman. Matthews is being tested because he's been a perpetrator of police brutality. He already failed Jigsaw's previous test, which you can learn about in this video, but his new test is to see whether or not he'll use excessive force to try to escape. Art Blank is a lawyer being tested for defending guilty people. You may remember all those years ago when Hoffman and Rig had the run-in with the abusive teacher. Well, this is the guy who represented him. Hoffman's role in all of this is to be the spectator and to make sure that the rules are followed. Just as John Kramer pretended to be dead in the original Saw and Amanda pretended to be part of the game in Saw 2, Hoffman wanted to keep an eye on this game as well. Looks like our friend Jigsaw likes to book himself front row seats to his own sick little games. It appeared that if Matthews failed to stay on the ice block, the water would come down and electrocute Hoffman as well. But no, he wasn't actually in danger because he had no reason to put himself in danger when he set up the game. It was all just to motivate Eric Matthews. So long story short though, Rig and Matthews both failed their tests, so Hoffman is the only one to walk away alive. But while that's all happening, let's not forget that the other game is still going on at the same time. The one with Lynn Denlin, Jeff Denlin, Amanda Young, and Jigsaw. Remember how Hoffman left that note for Amanda, the note that was his ultimate move to eliminate Amanda and Jigsaw who were standing in his way of complete freedom? Yes, that note. How about we roll it? Dear pesky plumbers. Ah, wrong note. Uh, roll the other note. Amanda, you were with Cecil the night Jill lost Gideon. You killed their child. You know it, and I know it. So do exactly as I say. Kill them, them. Oh, I will tell John what you did. Hoffman is referring to the night that John Kramer's unborn child was killed by an addict named Cecil. John does not know that Amanda was in on it too, and Amanda, for obvious reasons, doesn't really want him to find out. If you're wondering how Hoffman even knows, I'm guessing it was because he was a cop and probably reviewed security footage after the break-in was reported, but they didn't really have any evidence that Amanda was a part of it, and John never presses charges on Cecil anyway, so at the end of the day, the cops knew, but John didn't. So Amanda caves in to Hoffman's threat and kills Lynn Denlin at the end of the game. That causes Jeff Denlin to want to kill Amanda, which he does. Then, Jeff Denlin, who is still in a rage, kills Jigsaw for putting him and his family through all of this. This is a huge deal for Hoffman. Remember, the only reason he began helping Jigsaw in the first place was because Jigsaw threatened to release the truth about Hoffman getting revenge on his sister's killer if he didn't comply. That's the main reason that he helped Jigsaw from the events of the first Saw in 2004 through Saw 4 in 2006. But now, with Jigsaw and Amanda both out of the picture, Hoffman's secret was safe. There was nothing forcing him to continue Jigsaw's work anymore. He could easily go back to being a regular cop at this point. But this is the most interesting part of Hoffman's character arc. 
Some part of him liked being the Hand of Jigsaw. I think it goes back to the reason he got involved with all of this, his sister Angelina. Hoffman must have felt that in some way that by bringing her killer to justice, he was entitled to judge the fates of any future criminals in the city. He had become a cop to protect people, but found that the police didn't have enough power to enforce the law in a way that he sees fit. That's why he started bending the rules. It started when he signed the affidavit for Rig to get the abusive teacher thrown in jail, it continued when he murdered the junkie who threatened Matt Gibson, and it reached its peak when Hoffman literally became Jigsaw, who is now a feared symbol of twisted vigilante justice. In fact, over the last two years, as Hoffman got closer and closer to taking Amanda Young and John Kramer out of the equation, he developed a condition known as megalomania. Some of you may be more familiar with the Greek version of the word megalovania. Today, megalomania is known by mental health professionals as narcissistic personality disorder, but we're still gonna be calling it megalomania because it's way, way more fun to say. I think I'm actually gonna say megalomania as much as possible from now on. Megalomania is characterized by an intense obsession with power and delusions that they're more important than anyone around them. Other symptoms include calculative or manipulative behavior, violent tendencies, egotism, lack of empathy, entitlement, and a god complex. Cock it and pull it. With his new power as the sole proprietor of the Jigsaw legacy, Hoffman planned to run the city as he saw fit and punish anyone who got in his way. The only issue for him was that he was not the last Jigsaw disciple left standing. There was another. Shortly after the conclusion of the two simultaneous games, Special Agent Strom, who had been hot on the tail of Officer Rig for most of that day, showed up to the Gideon Meatpacking Plant with the hope that he could catch Jigsaw or whichever disciple was responsible. When Hoffman realized this, he saw the opportunity to possibly take him out as well, and quietly closed the door, locking Strom in the room with the corpses of John, Amanda, Lynn Denlin, and Jeff Denlin, before cutting the power. He then went to retrieve a pig mask to conceal his identity in case of the possibility of Strom surviving. John has left one more game behind for Agent Strom to find, and when he steps through the secret door, which is the only path forward, Hoffman takes him out and puts him to sleep. While Strom is out, he's placed inside the water cube trap. I guess Jigsaw watched way too many Panic at the Disco music videos on his deathbed and got a little inspired. Maybe more than a little bit. Hoffman assumes that Strom is going to die in the water cube and goes to rescue the Denlin's daughter, Corbett, who is being kept in a cell for motivation for Jeff to win his game, which as we know, didn't work out. So Hoffman brings her out to the police where he's lauded as a hero for saving this girl from Jigsaw. But to his surprise, he and Corbett are not the only two survivors. Agent Strom had punctured his trachea to survive the water cube trap, and was being brought out to the ambulance. When Hoffman sees Strom on a gurney, he knows his secret is not safe quite yet, not as long as Strom and the FBI continue to investigate. He makes up a story for the public about how he too ended up falling into a jigsaw trap, but his arm straps broke, and he was able to escape and find and rescue Corbett. As the police continue to infiltrate Gideon Meatpacking Plant, they eventually open the door and find the bodies of John, Amanda, Lynn, and Jeff, and send them to the morgue for an autopsy. And this is where we have have an error. Yeah, I've been able to piece everything together in a way that kind of makes sense up to this point, but I can't make any excuses for how the dates kind of contradict each other here. Remember how I said the simultaneous games took place on April 28th? We know that because the fingerprints that lead the FBI to rig came back on the 28th. The problem is that the date on John's autopsy tag is October 21st, 2006. See, it clearly says it right there. I'm sure I'm not the first one to notice this. What am I doing with my life? It doesn't take six months to do an autopsy, and judging by the lack of decomposition on John's body, I can't show it, but feel free to pull up the movie if you don't believe me, it hasn't been very long. So that means one of these dates has gotta be wrong, and all we can do is speculate on which one. And I think this one is wrong, and John's death was in April. Here's my rationale. We later see Hoffman looking at the evidence bag containing Strom's cell phone and the pen that he used to poke the hole in his neck. Those give us a month and day when the evidence was collected, May 7th, and then the day that the evidence was moved to storage, which appears to be July 7th. It makes much more sense that they find the evidence one week after Strom escaped the crime scene as opposed to seven months after, so let's just throw this tag out and say that Jigsaw's autopsy took place in late April or early May, and that's when they found the hidden tape in his stomach that has a message for Detective Hoffman. Roll it. Are you there, Detective? If so... You are probably the last man standing. Now perhaps you will succeed where the others have failed. You think you will walk away untested. I promise that my work will continue. 
Clever wording by Jigsaw here to hide the fact that he was working with Hoffman while still delivering that message, since there are other people in the room listening to the tape as well. In July, the police department holds a ceremony honoring all of the fallen officers lost throughout the Saw saga, where Detective Hoffman is promoted to Detective Lieutenant for his supposed heroics in putting an end to the Jigsaw murders and saving Corbett. When receiving his service award, he gives a speech about how life must be cherished and how true justice has been served. Again, this is also clever wording because the audience thinks he's talking about John Kramer being brought to justice when he's actually talking about everyone who went through Kramer's traps. And when he says life must be cherished, they think he's talking about the lives of the lost officers, but in reality, he's echoing Jigsaw's mantra, cherish your life. By doing so, we learn one of the reasons that Hoffman decides to continue operating as Jigsaw. It seems that he actually does believe in John's values, he just has different standards for judging whether or not people should be punished. And like I said, and enjoy continuing to say because it's a very fun word to say, this is probably a result of his megalomania. Megalomania. Once the fallout of the end of the Jigsaw case ended, Hoffman got to work on the next game. This is the one that John secretly told him about when he was on his deathbed, and it involves five people who all played a part in causing a deadly fire due to greed and corruption in their work. The specific traps and audio tapes were mostly all created by Jigsaw before his death, so all Hoffman had to do was start and facilitate the game by keeping an eye on it using these computer monitors. He believed that this would be the last favor that he has to do for John Kramer. After that, he should have free reign to find his own victims, but he hadn't quite seized the full power of Jigsaw just yet. Someone else was keeping an eye on him, and they made it known by sending a note, reading, I know who you are. The same note that he received after killing Seth Baxter. Remember, the first time he got this note, it was from John himself, so Hoffman can only speculate on who might be sending this new note. The only person Hoffman knows about who had inside knowledge was Amanda, but she died at the same time as John. He knew Agent Strom was onto him, but Strom wouldn't have known about the original note from 2004. This new note had the exact same wording. His best guess was that it's John's ex-wife, Jill Tuck, but it doesn't make sense for her either. They had already seen each other at Gideon Meatpacking Plant while they were putting the final touches on the simultaneous games back in April, so they both already knew about each other. And Hoffman didn't have to worry about her turning him in because she'd just be putting herself in danger by doing so. He's called into the hospital, where he finds Agent Strom sitting by Perez's hospital bed. This leads him to believe that the injuries she had sustained in one of John's traps had done her in. She wasn't really dead, I'm guessing she was just moved to another room for more intensive care, but Hoffman didn't know that. Strom tells him that the last thing she said was Detective Hoffman. He finds this very suspicious and perhaps unwisely, gives Hoffman an earful about how strange it is that Jigsaw would make a mistake by letting Hoffman escape. Because Jigsaw's dead. I'm not talking about him, I'm talking about you and your whole crooked department. My department's gone, they're all dead. There's no one left. Besides you. I feel so bad for Fisk. Nobody ever remembers Fisk. Play the sad music. What the hell man? what happened? Where's Rick? After making sure he's not being followed, Hoffman visits the new underground lair where he's monitoring the game and gets there just in time to see it begin. In Hoffman's new lair, we see a miniature model of the game that's taking place, just like the models that John used to use for his games. I think this is an important indicator of how much Hoffman had learned from John in their years together. We previously saw John giving Hoffman pointers on one of the traps, and now it would appear that Hoffman had learned everything about his methods, meaning that Hoffman could create his own games if he chose to. After checking in on the game, Hoffman decides that it's best to contact Strom and see if he can redirect his suspicions somewhere else. He calls the FBI's headquarters from an undisclosed location and asks for Strom, but is instead connected connected to his superior, Special Agent Erickson. Hoffman's strategy is to use Strom's own theory against him. He tells Erickson that Strom believes there was another accomplice outside of Amanda Young, perhaps someone on the inside. He just doesn't mention the part about it possibly being him. By doing this, he's secretly planting the seed of Strom being a suspect into Erickson's head. It's a risky move because that's sort of a double-edged sword, but it makes sense considering one of the side effects of megalomania is cockiness and overconfidence. Erickson asks to reconnect with him the next morning to discuss further, but Hoffman has one more idea to further the notion of Strom being a suspect in Erickson's head. He drives to where the FBI headquarters is located and waits for Erickson to come out. Then, using Strom's phone, which he recovered from the evidence bag, he calls Erickson and promptly hangs up. Erickson calls back, but he rejects the call and turns off the device. Another symptom of megalomania is the manipulation of others. Hoffman does this to remind Erickson about the idea he planted in his head earlier, the idea that Strom could be the second accomplice. It works, because Erickson tells his assistant to start tracking Strom's phone. Now, Hoffman can lead them wherever he pleases by simply leaving Strom's phone somewhere when he turns it back on. And that's exactly what he does. He goes back to his lair, where the game is being held, and leaves Strom's phone, along with several photos of Special Agent Erickson, to make it look like Strom was 
Jigsaw's successor and his boss was the next target. To top it off, he leaves a hot beverage on the desk to make it look like Strom had just been there recently. From there, Hoffman went back to the Metropolitan Police Department where Strom was waiting for him in secret. He again shows what a skilled manipulator he is by looking suspicious as he left the building, thereby getting Strom to follow him. He led Strom to an empty house where there was another trap waiting in the basement. Let's roll the tape. Hello, Agent Strom. If you are hearing this, then you have once again found what you are looking for. Or so you think. As the old adage goes, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. He actually reveals how to escape this trap, but Strom doesn't trust him at all, and thus doesn't believe him. When Hoffman goes into the room, Strom attacks him and forces him into the box, not realizing that Hoffman had been telling the truth, and that the box was actually the only way to escape the room. The walls close in, Star Wars garbage compactor style, and crush Agent Strom. This is an excellent example of how Hoffman had taken the teachings of Jigsaw and twisted them for his own benefit. His goal all along was to get rid of Strom, but he was unsuccessful in his first attempt. So the second time, he uses Jigsaw's teachings, specifically his teachings about how to anticipate the human mind to his advantage. If you're good at anticipating the human mind, it leaves nothing to chance. After getting out of the glass box, Hoffman recovers Strom's hand and uses it to plant fingerprints all over the crime scenes of previous victims. Part of the genius of making everyone think that Strom was the second accomplice to Jigsaw was that Hoffman could continue to run new traps and games, because everyone was out looking for Strom and not him. The next trap that Hoffman would put into action, however, would be another one designed by John Kramer. He had left instructions in his will for Jill Tuck to carry out even more new traps. She most likely contacted Hoffman to get his help with a few of them because she'd never actually been involved in John's operation and didn't have the experience. His next victims were a pair of malicious lenders who repossessed the valuables of desperate people in need. This was another game that was planned by John based on the fact that it's his voice in the tape but was never carried out before his death. So Hoffman got to do it instead. The victims see how it feels to give up what's vital to them by sacrificing their own flesh into a scale in order to survive. After the conclusion of the test, Hoffman does something interesting that Jigsaw had not. It seems that he was recording the audio of his victims trying to escape rather than staying behind and witnessing it himself. He plays it back after the fact, either to try to learn from the experience and improve his anticipation skills, or possibly just for his own sick pleasure, as he was starting to enjoy torturing people. After setting the trap, he's called in to investigate it, due to his unique position as lieutenant detective. There, he finds the FBI has taken over the investigation and that they had discovered the Strom fingerprints that he'd planted there. He also discovers that Special Agent Perez, who he previously thought to be deceased, was alive, well, and working on this investigation. Erickson had led Hoffman to believe that she was dead earlier that month because they actually had suspected Hoffman and wanted to have an extra piece to play against him if need be. But now that Strom was their number one target, the FBI offers to work with Hoffman. This is where Hoffman's sociopathy really shines more than ever before. He's basically toying with the FBI at this point. He feigns disinterest in working with them because of their dishonesty about the fate of Miss Perez, and this ultimately causes Erickson to offer him full disclosure on all future secrets, a deal that he accepts. From now on, everything we know, you know. Is that fair? The brilliant part is, he's basically guaranteed his own safety because he's now working with both parties who are investigating Jigsaw, the Metropolitan Police Department, and the FBI. However, these two may have been the only ones making a formal investigation, but there would be others in search of the truth. One day, Hoffman goes to visit the survivor of the flesh trap at the hospital, and on the way he runs into Pamela Jenkins, a journalist that he accuses of twisting facts to get a good story or as I like to call it, a journalist. Jenkins promises to dial down her articles if Mark can connect her with Jill Tuck, so he agrees to help her out. My guess is that he did so because he felt he would have even more power if he had the media on his side too. From there, he goes to visit the other victim of the flesh trap, the one who didn't make it. The autopsy reveals a different knife was used to cut the jigsaw piece compared to all of the other victims besides one, and that one is Seth Baxter, the man who killed Hoffman's sister. The FBI wants to find the Seth Baxter tape, and if Strom's voice is on it, that'll be all the evidence they need to publicly convince Victim. But I think they also secretly did still suspect Hoffman a little bit because he obviously did have the motive. That night, he goes to visit Jill Tuck at her work and demands that she give up the contents of the box left to her in John's will. This is just a prime example of Hoffman's megalomania. He is so desperate to control everything and everyone that he's willing to go against John's dying wishes and usurp the power of one of the few people that knows about him so that he can gain control of all aspects of the game. He makes her hand over the files of the victims who are to be tested next, a group of people who all work for or are connected to 
to this dirty insurance company called Umbrella Health. Meanwhile, Erickson and Perez are continuing the reinvestigation of the Seth Baxter case and ask Hoffman to come in to see their findings. They're able to uncover the master tape left behind at the pendulum trap, but it's been intentionally distorted, so they send it to a lab to be de-scrambled. This makes Hoffman nervous because he knows that his voice is on the tape and they'll eventually uncover it, but he has no choice but to travel with them to the lab. Come on, you're coming, right? Of course. It can be assumed that they go through some kind of security checkpoint before entering the FBI facility to separate Hoffman from his gun. Like I said, they were secretly a bit suspicious of him still. The scene at the lab where the audio is defiltered is perhaps my favorite scene in the Saw franchise. As the technician gets closer and closer to uncovering Hoffman's real voice, the tension in the room builds. You okay? Huh? You seem a little preoccupied. I'm just anxious about the tape. The pressure in Hoffman's chest continues to rise when Perez expresses her doubt that Strom is really responsible, based on his past behavior as her partner. She's basically making it clear to Hoffman that she never believed he was innocent. And you can just see Hoffman struggling to keep his cool as his big lie slowly unfolds in front of these FBI agents. He's quickly trying to throw together a plan in his head, using only a couple items from a snack table to prepare for the moment when he's exposed. But the big bomb is the moment when Erickson drops another discovery. Roll that clip. In other words? In other words, when he left his fingerprints on the latest victims, Strom was already dead right now. There it is. After two years of quietly helping Jigsaw, and after months of effort diverting the Metropolitan Police Department and the FBI, Mark Hoffman was finally backed into a corner, but he wasn't about to go down without a fight. He slashes Erickson with a pastry knife and burns Perez with a piping hot coffee. He uses the lab technician as a meat shield, protecting himself against Perez's gunshots long enough to get to her and take her out as well. Before finishing her off, he asks who else knows about him, to which she replies, Everyone. Everyone. <laughs> With that, he retrieves a can of gasoline from his car and comes back to burn the whole mother place to the ground. One of the most brutal details in this scene highlights how much of a psychopath Hoffman had become. When he returns to the lab, he notices Erickson still alive, and rather than put him out of his suffering before starting the fire, he chooses the most painful punishment imaginable and covers him in even more gasoline before lighting the flame and tossing the match. With his pursuers now taken care of, he returns to the zoo, the site of the game that was currently taking place, just in time to see the end of it. But when he gets there, he finds a relic from his past which fills him with even more uncertainty. It's the same note he left for Amanda three months ago, threatening her to kill Lynn Denlin. He realizes it's nearly impossible for anyone to know about this and knows that he's still in trouble when he sees it. When he sits down in the chair, he's jolted by a powerful wave of electricity. Whoever had been there had booby-trapped his seats. When he comes to, he discovers who was responsible, Jill Tuck. She had hidden one thing left for her in her ex-husband's will, the fact that Mark Hoffman was also meant to endure one more test. Hoffman knew this after hearing the tape found in Kramer's stomach at the autopsy, but after three months, he thought he was in the clear. Jill subjects him to a classic jigsaw device, the reverse bear trap, and leaves him in the room to die. Jill's instructions were to leave Hoffman restrained in the reverse bear trap as punishment for deviating from Jigsaw's plan. Hoffman was supposed to die there. The only problem was that Jill Tuck was no Jigsaw. She had not thought out every possible scenario the way John might have. And Hoffman is able to exploit this by breaking his hand with the machine fastened to his face, using it to untie himself from the chair, and lodging the reverse bear trap into the steel bars covering the window on the door. This prevents it from tearing his face open when time expires and gives him just enough time to escape from its confines. His jaw is damaged by the incident, but he does survive, and swears to have his revenge on Jill. After taping up his injured hand, he takes the reverse bear trap with him and retreats to a new safe house and an abandoned air hangar. He fixes himself up. Realizing that Jill got away and will probably go to the police, he knows that he'll never be able to go back to his old life and destroys his cell phone and ID cards. He also decides to lie low for a while and goes into hiding for the next eight months, not emerging again till March of 2007. During the time in hiding, he used his inside knowledge of the police headquarters to hack into the station's security system and spy on them. With him out and most of his department dead, the police chief brings back an old face to take over the Jigsaw investigation. Sorry, Fisk. He went with Officer Matt Gibson. Jesus. By the way, remember way, way back, about a half hour ago, when I told you he might come back? Gibson transferred to Internal Affairs, where he busted three of Hoffman's men, and Hoffman swore he'd have his revenge. Just remember that, because he could come back. I'm not saying it's gonna come back, but 
It might come back. Ah, yes. Good memories of when I was a younger creator. So Hoffman kept his eye on whatever was going on at the police station. He also had information on three more groups that Jigsaw never had time to test. So his next objective is to carry these out. First, he captures three participants of a toxic love triangle and puts them through a unique trap that takes place in public. The two men have to execute their former lover to survive. Next, four racists are trapped in an elaborate setup at Pete's auto body shop, and there are no survivors. He leaves a note for Gibson on the bathroom mirror, along with the reverse bear trap, which is covered in Jill Tuck's fingerprints. As if that's a reliable measure for anything at this point, considering all we've been through. And finally, the last game of the Jigsaw Saga is held on March 12th, and tests a man named Bobby Dagan, who had falsely claimed to be a survivor of a Jigsaw trap in order to sell his book. Hopefully I'm not the only one who appreciates the irony of Hoffman, who once pretended to be Jigsaw for personal gain, now setting up a real trap for Bobby, who had pretended to be a victim for personal gain. With the last of these traps set into motion, Hoffman could focus all of his efforts on what now mattered most to him, getting revenge on Jill Tuck and Matt Gibson. He starts by sending a DVD to Gibson's safe house in which he openly shows his face and requests that Gibson hands over Jill Tuck. If he complies, Hoffman says he will stop the last game and the killing will end. But Gibson has promised immunity to Jill and isn't about to trust a bargain made by a serial killer. Hoffman's next communication with Gibson is in an email video message, giving him a cryptic clue that he must look beyond the crossroad to the clear dawn. Look beyond the crossroad is a reference to Crossroads Manufacturing, which is the abandoned factory turned flop house where Hoffman saved Gibson's life all those years ago, and Clear Dawn is a reference to Clear Dawn Psychiatric Hospital, where the man who nearly killed Gibson used to be a patient. That's where the Bobby Dagan game is being held, but Hoffman goes back to Pete's auto body, which is where the car trap was located and remotely detonates a bomb nearby in order to lure all the cops, who were still collecting evidence, outside for a little while. Hoffman uses this time to go into a hidden room inside the auto body shop and check on the video feed of the game using the monitors. Then, he sets up a trap for Gibson and his men, who would soon be on their way after they trace his email back to this room. And this is the moment that all of the training with Jigsaw finally pays off for Hoffman. He had studied under John Kramer to learn the ways of a great mechanical engineer. He had practiced for nearly three years by tweaking and carrying out John's traps, and he had obtained the experience needed to fully create a trap of his own. He disregarded John's code of conduct though. This trap's intention was not to rehabilitate, but rather to kill. He removed the body of one of the victims of the card trap and placed him in the room wearing Jigsaw's cloak so that Gibson would be lured into the trap and executed by the motion-activated turret hidden in the corner of the room. We know that Hoffman had long desired his revenge on Gibson, but the fact that he wasn't even there for his death shows where Mark's priorities were at the time. He was still mad about Jill Tuck trying to kill him in the reverse bear trap and then selling him out to the cops, and his one burning desire at that point was to get to her and have his revenge. He hid himself in the now empty body bag of the fourth victim, which was a clever way of sneaking himself into the police station. Once there, he went on a huge killing spree. It started with the coroner. This was the man whose discovery about the knife that cut each jigsaw piece had led the FBI to reopen their investigation about Seth Baxter, which ultimately led to Hoffman getting caught. Now I may need dead meat to back me up on this, I mean I'm the history expert, not the math expert, but according to my calculations, I believe he kills five more people at the police station on his way to the holding cell where Jill is being kept. When he gets into the cell, he forcefully grabs her by the hair and asks, How do I look? Which seems like a weird thing to say at first. I mean, they're not going on a date, they're basically trying to kill each other which is usually more of a third date activity for me, but I think the line is a reference to the fact that this is the first time that they've seen each other since Jill put the reverse bear trap on him, which messed up his jaw and permanently changed his appearance. She stabs him in the neck with a nail file and scampers away, where she hides in the evidence room. But Hoffman, who was again able to use his jigsaw powers to anticipate her actions, goes in after her. But Jill Tuck would not be the only thing that he found there. After discovering Jill's hiding place, Hoffman realized exactly where he was. He was in the evidence room, meaning he would have access to the same tool that Jill had tried to kill him with eight months ago, the reverse bear trap. This is actually the version of the bear trap that Jigsaw had used to test Amanda way back when she was being tested. He finds it most fitting to leave Jill behind in the same position on the same chair she had shocked him with the previous summer. But unlike Hoffman, Jill does not have what it takes to escape, and she is killed. After the trap ends her life, Hoffman closes with the iconic Jigsaw phrase. Game over. Even a small change like this, saying game over after the victim's death as opposed to before, is indicative of how Hoffman's version of Jigsaw refused to play by the rules the way that Kramer's version of Jigsaw did. Hoffman has his own dirty way of doing things, that is inspired by Jigsaw but not limited by a code of conduct. 
Woods. Having gotten his revenge, he retires to his secret safe house in the hangar, where he prepares a full bag of money and supplies. He's probably planning to go into hiding again for a little while, since he just took out an entire police station, which is likely to draw more federal attention. Wanting to clear out everything and start somewhere new, he lights up the hangar on his way out. But before he can make it very far, he's captured by three men in pig masks. Throughout the course of this saga, Hoffman had brilliantly accounted for everything his opposition would throw at him, but there was still one thing he was not able to solve. Who had sent him the note, I know who you are? The answer would take Hoffman back to 2004, where one of his first tasks under John Kramer was to plant a doctor's pen light at one of the crime scenes, and that doctor was named Lawrence Gordon. Unbeknownst to Hoffman, Gordon had become a secret apprentice to Jigsaw after surviving the bathroom game in 2004, and was working behind the scenes for John ever since. He kept an eye on Hoffman after John's death, and was instructed to act immediately if anything were to happen to Jill. According to John's orders, Gordon was to take Hoffman to the same bathroom where he had once been tested, and leave him with no escape. Hoffman desperately reaches for the hacksaw, but Gordon takes it and throws it out of reach. Game over. Notice how he does it correctly by saying it before the victim's death? Just saying. So we're here, we're almost at the end of this very long video, but we've actually hit a bit of a point of contention among Saw fans, because that's the last we see of Hoffman. And there's a little bit of a divide over his ultimate fate. Did he die in the bathroom, or would he have found some way to escape? There are even conflicting reports from the creators of the film. In an audio commentary on Saw 7, they mention that Hoffman is dead, but according to the actor that played him, Costas Mandylor, or as I like to call him, the Mandylorian, Hoffman is still alive. So with all that being said, I have the answer. Hoffman's dead, and here's why. Outside of the fact that it would totally undo Saws 4 through 7 and make them essentially pointless, let's look at the canon for our answer. We don't see anything that happened after Hoffman was left in the bathroom until the next sequel, Jigsaw, came out in 2017. In Jigsaw, the killings began again after 10 years of inactivity, and another investigation opens up. Nobody at any point mentions Hoffman as a possible suspect, and this is most likely because they eventually discovered the bathroom and found him dead there. And yes, we do know that they discovered the bathroom because Eleanor has a replica of the hacksaws, and these weren't something that could be found in any other location. So that's why I think Hoffman is almost definitely dead, and I say almost because it could be that he escaped and he's in jail somewhere, but if that was the case, you'd think that the new investigators in Jigsaw would at least double check that he hadn't escaped or something. And on top of that, the end of his story is just a more fitting way to go out. But until we see his grave or some kind of confirmation in a future sequel, I know that you Hoffman fans aren't ever gonna shut up, so I'll just leave it at that for now. Let me know your opinion on that in the comments, and if you want to see more of your favorite Saw characters on horror history, then click that playlist on the left. And if you love horror or if you love Saw, then there's gonna be more content on the way soon. We're getting pretty close to a new Saw movie coming out, so make sure you subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring that death bell for notifications, and I'll see you in the next one. Megalomania, 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 assuming we both survive.